get started for anybody who drops by on the Facebook. Sounds good. So just to kind of continue the conversation we were having off screen while we're waiting for some more folks to join us, um, when you're picking out that, that when you're in that, that moment, when you're picking out your next book, are you, do you choose it by cover or do you have a plan in mind for the next one you're going to pick? Do you have like a list that you're going through? Mm, um, no list. Uh, there's definitely, you know, I pass, I pass by these shelves every day. So I'm always looking at them and of course, different books pop into my mind or in my periphery. And I, I think about them, but, um, no, when I, when I'm picking a new book to read after I've just finished one, it's all based on feeling. And despite being someone who has an eye catching cover, that, you know, many people have mentioned to me, oh, you know, your cover is what drew me in. Um, throughout my life, there's probably only ever been one or two times I've read something because, because of the cover. And I distinctly remember this one book, Black Moses. I was in the Strand and I saw the cover and I said, I want to read this, whatever it is. But no, for me, it's fully based on feeling of where I'm at um, in my life, where I'm at as a writer and what can serve me as those two people best in the moment. So before we got on the Zoom, we were talking about um, Junpa Lumpiri's book, uh, Interpreter of Maladies, right? I had never read it. I see on the front and one in the pen Hemingway, one the Pulitzer, her name throughout my, my entire life has been thrown around. I, I know that um, she's a part of the canon and well-respected. And the book, it was a book of short stories. So I knew that I'd be able to move through it quickly. And I can imagine that the prose is very good. So these are all things that um, I want to transfer into my own writing in, in terms of the work that I'm working on now. So that's how I picked it last night after reading a book called The 10,000 Doors of January by Alex Eat Harrow that was recommended to me by a friend. Um, it's like speculative fiction and it was vast and it was very big and sprawling. Um, so yeah, I went to this. I try not to read the same genre or the same type of book that could elicit a similar feeling back to back. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, Mina, do we wanna go ahead and press record and we can just go ahead and get started? Excellent, sounds good. All right, so let's truly get this party underway. All right. So the very first question is the question of the hour. What is currently on your TBR, your to be read pile? Yeah, uh, like top five, top 10, top 20? Uh, somewhere in between, you know, maybe top five, if you're really enthusiastic about them, you wanna give us a little more, or, you know, if you wanna kind of go top 10, if you just wanna kind of spit some titles, whatever, whatever is you're excited about, you go ahead. Definitely. So uh, Candace Cardi Williams has uh, just released her sophomore novel in the UK. For those who don't know, Candace Cardi Williams had written a book called Queenie, which was incredible. I believe that it won the British Book Award and many other accolades. And her sophomore novel or sophomore adult novel, um, this book right behind me called People Person, I wanted it so badly that I ordered it from Waterstones across the pond in the UK because it hasn't come out in the US yet. So very much so looking forward to reading that. Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart has been on my shelf for a while. I uh, haven't cracked it open, but again, really, really, really want to read that. Um, there is a memorial by Brian Washington also on my shelf behind me. I'm a big fan of Brian Washington. I was on a panel with him and he's just such a warm, intelligent individual. And I really loved his book of short stories called Lot. And who knows, there's, there's probably some Toni Morrison in there. There's 100 Days of Solitude that I've actually never read. Again, another book, I actually try not to read books that are so much in the canon because I feel like, what is the canon? You know, I couldn't care less about Faulkner. <laughs> I read Hemingway once, couldn't care less about him. Don't I not really agree I, with you there. I went through yeah. that in my English class. I was like, wow. It's too much. Like, you know, and, and Toni Morrison, fortunately, is part of the canon, right? And she's wonderful. Um, but I have some books of Toni Morrison on my shelf that I haven't read yet because I know how I feel after I read Toni Morrison. And I could probably only do it once or twice a year, you know? Um, and plus, she's the type of writer that I want to live with me throughout my life. I don't want to have read all of her books by the age of like 30 or whatever, you know? So those are a few books. There's um, 
Hanif Abdurraqib, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, a book of essays with the wolf on the front. I liked that cover a lot. Um, got to know Hanif a little bit, and I just respect them so much as an author and an individual. So that's also a book I want to read. Um, Dune, that's one of those wish reads. I have it all the way up there. Like, I don't know, because then it's for me, you know, if I read Dune, and I'm not someone that eats a book in a day. I'm not someone that takes you know, a month to read 300 pages, I could read maybe a book a week, a book every week and a half, but a book like Dune is a real investment, right? Especially if I'm not so invested halfway and I'm someone who doesn't throw books away, even if I don't like them, I need to complete them. That's just the way that I work. And like you and I were talking offline, um, if I'm not feeling a book, I want to get to the end to better understand why I wasn't feeling it. So Dune is up there. If I'm on like an island, for a month, a month and a half, I'll take you with me. But the con of that is that I'm not allowing myself to watch the movie until I read the book. And I do want to watch the movie. So the TBR is long. The TBR is long. And, and many books on my TBR are books that I haven't even uh, purchased or I haven't even looked into getting from the library yet. Um, those books, you know, it, it, for example, uh, The Plot, which came out um, last year, I believe. There is uh, Young Mungo, Douglas Stewart's new book, um, Station Eleven by Emily St. Mandel, her new one, Sea of Tranquility. These Ghosts Are Family. Uh, I believe that's by uh, Maisie Card. Detransition Baby, Tori Peters, never read that. There's, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay, well, let's circle to things that you have read recently that you've loved. Uh, you mentioned one of them. And before you answer, I just wanted to also read out, we've got a comment on Facebook saying that this person always goes by the covers when they pick what they read. So they're the opposite of you. Well, covers, you can ju judge books off of covers these days. And, you know, as an author, I'll tell you, cover meetings can be extremely uh, tense. <laughs> a lot of differing opinions, yeah. How much say do you get in your cover? I know I already asked you another question. Now I'm hitting you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is what we're here for, the uh, spontaneity. Um, it depends. It depends on who you are. It depends on the tone that is set uh, from the outset of your, your relationship with an editor and a publisher. Um, I think it, it also depends on respect. There are so many different factors that go into it. You have a lot of um, people who say debut authors will have absolutely no say that a publisher can do whatever they want. In my experience, that wasn't the case. Um, there was very much so, very much so back and forth. Um, I was giving my honest opinion, but also I recognized and articulated that I have never sold books and I am not a book designer. So my artistic sensibility might not be what makes someone want to buy a book or even crack it open, you know, going to Ashland Library or, you know, a bookstore here in New York. Um, so I tried to approach it by being honest but also letting people do their jobs. And that combination led us to a cover that uh, is one that typically draws people in and has been very memorable and has been so successful that despite publishing the book in the UK and France, they use the same cover basically. <laughs> you know, like this, this version right here is the same cover, but in blue in the UK. They just changed the color, yeah. Now, um, Back to your question. Yes, and I just realized as you were answering it that I got, I was so excited to talk to you that I forgot to introduce you and us and sure. the program here tonight. Yeah, let's do it. So let me just jump in really quick. Hello, my name is Laura Villamut. My pronouns are she and her, and I am head of outreach and community experience at the Framingham Public Library. With me here tonight is Nina Jane, director of the Ashland Public Library. And we are so excited that you have joined us for this ongoing series, TBR to be read where we get to talk to some of our favorite authors about books that they've loved, books that they're excited about reading um, so that you can add them to your lists. Tonight, we're thrilled to be joined by Matteo Ascaripur. Am I saying that right? Yep. Fabulous. Um, so welcome Matteo. His debut novel, Black Buck is a definite must read. So be sure you add that to your list along with some of the others that he will be talking about tonight. And with that, Matteo, why don't you tell us some of the books you've read recently that you've loved? Definitely. Thank you, Laura. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to the patrons of the Ashland Library and Mina and all the people that are that are doing what they got to do to make sure that people can read these books, these free books that aren't banned and promoting literacy. And I know that libraries are more than just 
being a beautiful place uh, where people can go and get books. There's programming. And for me, libraries were a safe space growing up where I could go and felt very comfortable and I could use the computer. So uh, libraries all day. Now, in terms of books that I've read that I've really liked, I read a book that hasn't come out yet called Nuclear Family by a writer named Joseph Hahn. And that book rocked me to my core. The characters were so vibrant. Uh, Joseph took so many risks in terms of form that were very surprising to me. And I love any writer who takes real risk, where I feel as though there are stakes, not just for their characters, but also with them on the page. Because you know, a lot of people might feel a pull, especially a debut author, to try to write the easy narrative that gets the bow on top at the end and everything is great. Um, but Joseph took some risks, at least things that I perceived as risks. And I, I, I can't laud this book enough, Nuclear Family. I read a book called Stories from the Tenants Downstairs. Also hasn't come out yet by a writer named Sadiq Fofana. This book is a book of short stories, um, all taking place related to tenants from a, uh, a, a project building in um, uptown New York, Harlem. And these characters are funny. They do the unexpected. There's hope, there's humanity, and there's also uh, realistic struggles depicted that people um, live through in their lives, but also as it relates to this story, just to make rent. So loved that. Um, let's see, there is a, a book that I read um, last year and this was called, um, let me see, cause I I, I'll give my love to the savages. I have the author's head uh, name in my head, Chris Stuck. And I even have a, a short story he wrote, but give my love to the savages, a book of short stories were so, creative. He really pushed the boundaries. They were hilarious, but also very much so grounded in the reality that so many of us um, experience. Open Water book by Caleb Azuma Nelson came out last year, uh, won many awards in the UK. Um, couldn't love this book more. It is a heartbreaking love story um, between two artists in the UK, and it is quiet but in a way that also shakes you to your core because of how loudly it resonates in your being. Um, I know that sounds like a contradiction, but for those who, ha who have read those types of books, you know what I mean, right? Like they're so poetic, but they can, cr they can crack you in half. Um, yeah, so those, those are some books that I've read. Uh, the Man Who Fell to Earth um, by Walter Tevis. It's an older book. Um, he is the man that wrote The Queen's Gambit, which was turned into the Netflix series. So I loved that show so much that I started looking to his backlist and I saw that he had written a variety of different novels, um, dipping in and out of a variety of genres, which is something that I aim to do as well. So The Man Who Fell to Earth is probably the most realistic depiction of what would happen if an alien being were to actually come here. Like it feels so real. There's it, there's, it just feels very realistic. So I'm going to stop here because we could keep going all night. I mean, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Um, we've kind of talked about, you know, reading inside and outside of the canon. What books can you point to that inspired you to become a writer? Hmm. Um, to be completely honest, I don't know if there were any books that, yeah. And I know that that sounds surprising, right? For me, um, this is the time when I give you a real answer, not like an answer that may, maybe some authors feel like they have to give. For me, writing, and I only began writing seriously in 2016, it was an outlet for me. I needed an escape from the life that I was living. And I began writing essays and articles uh, tangentially related to the world that I was in, which was startups and sales. And then I said, I've always liked fiction. I haven't been reading a ton of fiction at this point in my life, but let me write a novel. I want to write a novel. And again, that for me was an outlet. And I realized that writing fiction was a very specific form of salvation. I felt so free. I felt um, in control and I needed control at that time in my life. So that was what drove me to write. And I'd I wrote two books when I, when I took up that mantle and they didn't go anywhere. It took me two books to then just say, screw it, I'm gonna write something completely different. And, and that was Black Buck, the book that's behind me. So it wasn't any one book, but I will say that as I was writing Black Buck, 
um, again, my, my third manuscript, I was thinking about the way that James Baldwin made me feel whenever I read his books, the anger that he would elicit in me. And I wanted people to not just feel one thing, but many things. So that stayed with me. I had read Paul, Paul um, Beatty's The Sellout right before I began writing Black Buck. And that book in many ways gave me the confidence to be unrestrained on the page to a certain extent and write something very boundary pushing. There's Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie in Americana, which I read that in 2017 um, as I was working on my second book and uh, or second unpublished book. And I felt as though the prose was so simple and so beautiful in a way that it allowed me to be right in the scene. You know, some writers, especially new writers, think that they have to be overly verbose to fit into this canon to appease this faceless academic mass. So they come up with all these convoluted sentences where you might not even understand what's going on. I find myself in, the, in those ways and I've written in that way myself, but um, reading Americana, reading books that hold language and simple language to high esteem so that a reader can understand what's happening in the story inspired me to do the same with Black Buck. So, yeah. Now that you are a, a published author, do you find that there are writers who begin to inspire you now or do you kind of have the, a similar mindset to when you got started? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's more than writers. It's like, as I was writing Black Buck, right? When I, when I was answering the question saying that there were no books, I'm talking about the specific point in time that I began to write and what pushed me there. But as I was writing, I was reading so many books um, and watching so many films and documentaries and listening to music and going to plays that um, allowed me to complete my work. Um, some of those people are now my peers and people who I didn't even know before, like Nafisa Thompson Spires, who wrote Heads of the Colored People. Um, love that book so much. Someone like Jason Reynolds, you know, Jason Reynolds has become a friend and he helped me in many ways unlock a certain level of confidence that I needed in order to write the book that I wanted. Um, you have someone like Mitchell S. Jackson, who wrote a book called The Residue Years, and that played a pivotal role, not just in inspiring me, but um, helping me break the fourth wall in Black Buck. I'm continually inspired, you know, Homegoing by Yad Jesse, um, How Much of These Hills is, is Gold by C. Pam Zhang. Um, these are books that I read. The guy that I brought up before, Chris Stuck, his collection of short stories, Give My Love to the Savages, um, was so amazing that it really made me want to level up. So I'm continually inspired by people writing today, people who had written in the past, but it goes beyond literature for me. It, it, it extends to, to music, film, television, dance, so many different uh, modes of creativity and expression. So would you, the Black Buck is, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more kind of a contemporarily realistic kind of modern fiction piece. Um, yeah. Would you consider that your writing genre? And would you consider that your reading genre? Or where do you find yourself gravitating for, for writing and for reading? Yeah. Um, it's easier to answer about writing. Um, I don't, I don't have a genre, you know, I've only written one book and Black Buck um, incorporates many genres. It is a, a romance, it's a drama, it is satirical, it's absurdist in many ways. Um, and then by the end, it turns to a thriller, which I hadn't even anticipated to be completely honest when I was writing, but it turns into a thriller. Um, so I would like to continue writing books that defy genres to a certain extent. And I never want to pigeonhole myself, you know, um, someone like Stephen King could probably write whatever he wants in any genre. We know him as a horror writer, right? Um, I don't know if I ever want to be known as a certain type of writer, to be completely honest. It would get boring for me. And it's easy for some people to do that because that's what they're drawn to most. And if they're successful, then it's like rinse and repeat. But I don't want to do that. I didn't come into this industry to do what's easy. When it comes to reading, though, I will say that I'm typically drawn to realistic fiction, for sure. The book that I just finished that I was telling you about, The 10,000 Doors of January, though I am writing something speculative right now, um, I don't consume a ton of speculative books or anything related to fantasy. And there's reasons for that. And I also try not to consume too much of a genre that I'm looking to write in because I don't want 
to have any rules in my head as I'm writing, because then maybe I will start sticking to a genre rather than trying to break it. Um, but yeah, I don't read a lot of horror, don't read a lot of uh, thriller, don't read um, a lot of fantasy, but that's not to say that I might not read two or three of those different types of books in a year. If something piques my interest, I don't care what genre is in, I'm going to read it. But what I'm typically drawn to is realistic fiction, whether it's from the 50s or 60s or whether it's from, you know, last year. Do you have a go-to book or author that's kind of your comfort read? Hmm. Wow. That's a great question. Comfort read. Um, can't, I wouldn't describe it as having a comfort read. I try to read things typically that aren't going to make me comfortable. There are times when I read something quite serious and quite draining that then I want something far lighter. I definitely have some of those lighter books, um, but I don't often read those authors again, you know? because it's just like, there's a ton of light books that I could read and I might want to switch it up. Um, I will say that a book that felt, no, because it wasn't even super light. I was going to say A Man Called Ove. That was sad in some ways, but I loved it so much. But it was a book that I, that I didn't think was going to have the gravity that it did. I also read, what was his other book? Anxious People. Um, and I felt like that was a light book, to be completely honest, um, with a, a, um, a web of a plot that he pulled off that I liked. Um, but nah, no comfort reads. There's authors that I'll always read, though, right? Britt Bennett comes out with something. I'm always going to read that. Yeah, Jesse comes out with something. I'm always going to read that. Um, so many of my friends, Robert Jones Jr., Zakia Del Delilah Harris, um, Naima Koster, Clavis Natera, who has a book coming out, Neruda on the Park. Any of these people write something, I'm going to read it. Um, people who are dead is like William Melvin Kelly. I have a bunch of his books that his family had sent to me actually last year. Um, he's been gone for a few years, but I can't wait to continue reading his books. John Williams, Chester Himes. Um, I have to read, I think, one or two other books that Ann Petrie came out. I don't know if it's only one other book, but I'd only read The Street. So there's a rich world of literature out there. And I just feel grateful to be able to consume as much of it as I can and, and derive as much inspiration from it as possible. What's the very first book that you remember reading on your own? Hmm. Maybe Clifford, the big red dog or something like that. I'm not <laughs> sure. Yeah, I remember being in um, the bed with my grandma and my younger brother and her having me sound out Clifford when I was three. And my grandma, she was an English teacher in Jamaica. And then she lived with us here in the States. And I remember that memory fondly and just receiving this love of literature and the sacred word from her and my mother. Um, so I imagine that I would have read Clifford on my own after that. Growing up, I wasn't reading anything profound. I was reading Franklin. He can count by twos and tie his shoes and even do multiplication. I was reading Frog and Toad, which later on did I realize how subversive it actually was because some people claim that they were queer. And I love that. I love that, that that's what I was reading at that time. And I was able to see that type of relationship, whether they were or not, or if it was just a great friendship, doesn't matter. Loved Frog and Toad. And um, I love learning more about it as time has gone on. Uh, there was a book called Dr. DeSoto about, I think he was like a mouse or a rat who was also a dentist. Um, yeah, so those, those were the books that I was reading. Of course, like Where the Sidewalk Ends. That book, I have to go back and read it actually because I feel like it had a profound effect on me more than I realized when I was a kid. If there are a lot of rhymes in Where the Sidewalk Ends, then it definitely had a profound impact on me because I love to rhyme and it comes to me somewhat easily. Uh, and I feel, I'm like going back into like a repressed memory. I feel like it was Shel Silverstein who got me there. So yeah, those are some of the books I was reading when I was a kid on my own. Lots of rhymes in Shel Silverstein and lots of susical inventions too. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what's a book that you've loved that you can't believe isn't better known? Uh, the Man Who Cried I Am by John A. Williams. Um, if He Hollers, Let Him Go, Chester Himes, The Street by Ann Petrie. 
Um, yeah, those, those types of books, Corregidora by Gail Jones, books that people had put me on that I never even heard of. You know, growing up, if someone were to ask me, what are the books of the black canon? You would say Toni Morrison and James Baldwin. And maybe if you were exposed to it, Langston Hughes, probably you wouldn't even say Zora Neale Hurston, you know? Um, I don't even think many, too many people are reading Zora Neale Hurston today. Their eyes were watching God and, and how profound and innovative and groundbreaking that was in the way that she captured language in, in such a realistic way. Um, so yeah, those, those are a handful of books and there's probably some books behind me. I think there was a book called The Autobiography of an Ex-Serial Killer. I forget who the author was, but my editor had published it at HMH and I thought that that book was great. It was like a novella. Um, I'm a big fan of Philip Roth. So like Goodbye Columbus, um, The Human Stain. What was the other one? American Pastoral. I don't really hear people talk about those types of books. You know, Philip Roth, even though he's dead, is still embroiled in controversy because, you know, just sort of the way he was and also the biographer who was about to release that biography, right? But then uh, came to light that he was doing some unsavory things. So, uh, but I don't really hear many people talking about having read Philip Roth, but I, I like some of his, his novels. Um, yeah, there's very controversial. I'll be honest. There's an author named Iceberg Slim. And I love Iceberg Slim's work. It's not like I always like what's inside there because he depicts harrowing um, scenes and, and abuse. But he has such a strong voice. His first book is called Pimp. That is partially based on his own experiences having been a pimp in Chicago in like the 50s or the 60s. And again, there are some very difficult traumatic scenes in there that I do not condone. Um, but I like the way that he writes. So yeah, uh, those are, I'm looking at my favorite shelves over here. Those are some of the books. This guy, Charles Johnson, he wrote a book called Middle Passage that I also really liked. Uh, Behold the Dreamers in Bolo Mbue from many years ago, many years ago being like three, four, five, but I don't hear people talk about that book anymore. Behold the Dreamers, really liked it. And uh, there's a book called, is it called Bandy? Let me see. I think Bandy is the, the name of the author. The book is called The Accusation. And this is a book that I read years ago. Um, pretty sure it's a collection of short stories that was smuggled um, out of North Korea. And the author, they call him or them Bandy, which I think means Firefly or something like that, but they don't even know who actually wrote them. But supposedly they were smuggled outside of North Korea. And I just remember loving how realistic, uh, not realistic because I've never been there, but how, how real it felt. It felt like an honest depiction of a world that I, I know nothing about because I've never been there. Well, goodness, um, got a whole new stack of books on my list from a bedside table. Um, I, we're almost out of time already. Half an hour has completely flown by. Uh, oh. But before we let you go, we would love to know what is what is on the near future for you? What can we look forward to working on other books, other projects, mm -hmm. TV, movies? Yeah, so uh, doing some stuff with TV, definitely. Um, I am working on some short stories and who knows when those will ever come out. It's not like a collection. It's just for different people or anthologies. Um, I'm working on my second novel, which is called Invisible Faces. TBD, if, if it's going to be changed, um, maybe that'll come out in 2023. We'll see. And uh, I have my hands on in other types of um, writerly or literary types of projects. But for anyone, you know, that's in different areas, I'll be at book festivals in the Bronx, in Harlem, in New Jersey, going to France twice this year, might be in Aspen. So yeah, just um, you can follow me on Instagram at askmateo, A-S-K-M-A-T-E-O. You can, you can even email me, mateo at mateorights.com. And uh, we can stay connected and you can stay in the loop. Sounds very exciting. I'm sure we have lots of folks here and also people who will watch this video later um, who will do just that. And with that, thank you so much for being here tonight, Mateo. Thank you to everybody who joined us here in the, the Zoom as well as on Facebook. And uh, if you didn't get the chance to join us right away tonight or you know somebody who would like to 
watch this video in its entirety and they weren't able to be here, please check out the Ashland Public Library YouTube channel and or Facebook and you will be able to get the full uh, experience of hearing Mateo talk about his favorite books. And of course, Nina will also be following up after the event, I believe it's sometime in the next couple of days with the complete list of all the authors and books that Mateo mentioned tonight. Laura, thank you for your questions and your time. Mina, Jane, and Ashland Public Library, thank you for having me. Everyone who joined, really appreciate it. And uh, until next time. Thank you so much. Bye.